chapter 4. Rather lengthy passage, but please uh, stay with me. John chapter 4, begin reading with verse number 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. I, I love verse 4, but he, he needed to go through Samaria. Oh, if you look at the map of those days, Samaria was out of the way. His disciples wanted to avoid Samaria. You know why? Samaria was an integrated country. It was a mixed race people. And Jesus or his disciples were a bunch of olive-colored Jews and they would have avoided Samaria. But Jesus had a purpose to go through Samaria, and we're going to find that purpose out because there was one soul, one thirsty woman, and Jesus knew that she would be there. I'll tell you what, Jesus knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows your address. I even tell people, he knows what's in your refrigerator. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water shall, that I shall give him will be Come in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Father, thank you for your word today. Father, we have sensed your presence and 
Lord, from the very beginning of this service, we know that you're here. No, oh God, we pray that you would enable us to hear what you want us to hear today. And they enable this old preacher to stay true to what you've laid on my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We exist to glorify God. You want a purpose for your life? It is to glorify God. There's no greater reason for our existence. Everything we do must be funneled or sifted through that purpose. If God is not glorified in it, don't do it. If it will not bring glory to God, don't try it. If sitting in a pew is all we do, God is not glorified by our occupation of padded pews. If what we do for God is restricted only to the four walls of this building, God is not glorified by that. Our ultimate purpose as an individual and as a body of Christ is to bring glory to Him. We talked last Sunday about the importance of atmosphere. Did, did you sense the atmosphere this morning? This morning I want to talk about the subject of worship. And friend, we gather in this building to worship God. That's not the only reason we come together, but it is the number one reason. We come together to learn of Him. We, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. When you invite Christ into your life, He makes you a disciple. And a disciple is a learner. So that's why the church has always had a Sunday school, although in some churches that's a thing of the past. That's why we have youth meetings, and in some churches that's a gone too. That's why we should have all kinds of educational opportunities so we can be learners together. There was a time in my history when the Sunday school had more attendance than the morning worship service. And I remember people going to Sunday school and after Sunday school they'd go home. Quite different today. But our ultimate purpose for coming together is to worship God. We don't come together just to worship. We come together to worship God. And so there are a few things I want to say before I get into the heart of the message. And the first one is this. It matters who you worship. I mean, it really does matter who we worship. One of the real problems we've had in our country in the past few decades is the, the near celebrity status of many preachers. Now, now church, you know that I have not all, that I have not, had much respect nor like for TV preachers. I, I'm just not a fan. I mean, when someone in your family dies, call them and see if they'll come visit you. But they'll send you, you know, wanting a donation. Some even said, if you give me $100, God will give you 1000 and I was tempted, never did send him any, but I was tempted to say, well, that works both ways. Why don't you give me $100 and see if God will give you a 1000 But I never sent the letter, Mike. Wanted to. But I, I remember a, a TV preacher in Atlanta area. If I called his name, you'd know who I was talking about. But he had so many, he had so many tour buses that brought in visitors every Sunday that he had to ask his re regular members to go to another room and watch the service via satellite because of the tour buses. And some people got mad because they couldn't get in to hear him preach. I read a, of an incident by Lyman Beecher Stowe. 
He wrote an article in his book, he wrote a, a, about a section in his book, Saints, Sinners, and Beechers. He told of one occasion when Thomas K. Beecher substituted for his famous brother, Henry Ward Beecher, at the Plymouth Church in New York. And so there were a lot of curiosity sing, uh, seekers had come to hear this famous preacher preach. And when his brother got up, uh, in the pulpit instead of Henry Ward Beecher, some of the people got up and started for the door. The guy that they had heard to preach, you know, wasn't preaching, so his brother was there, so you know, they just got up and started leaving. And he, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, everybody that came here to worship Henry Ward Beecher, you may leave. And all of you who came here to worship God, you, you stay in your pew. It matters who you worship when people come together. If people are coming to hear a preacher, they're coming for the wrong reason. And I've heard people get excited about a new preacher. Oh, man, you ought to hear this guy. You ought to hear this guy. You know. And if they had talked about Jesus that way, it might make a difference. If you come to hear a preacher, you're coming for the wrong reason. That includes me. Some folks say, well, he represents God. Well, listen to me. I put it in your notes. Worship of an image that represents God is absurd as well as wicked. Come on, help me out here. God is, a, God is spirit, and, and no image can represent a spirit. It matters how you worship. No set forms of worship can be offered as a substitute for heart worship. Liturgy can't replace spiritual life. We can sing three verses and sit down, read a Bible verse and stand up, and we can go to the lectionary and we can go all through those. You know, and I'm not being critical. I'm just saying all of those things uh, as a, with an absence of true heart worship doesn't mean a thing. Liturgy without spiritual life is a fulfillment of what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. He says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, blasphemers disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors. Does that sound familiar? Is that a pretty good description of our culture today? But look at Verse 5, it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And Paul says, from such people, turn away. Worship structure can never be a substitute for heart worship. I want to tell you, you can, you can worship the Lord when Aunt Lucy plays the piano like she reads her Bible, seek and you shall find. It doesn't matter who sings if you're there to worship the Lord. It doesn't matter if the preacher is eloquent or if he stammers and stutters when he speaks. If you're there to worship God, you come for the right reason. Thirdly, it matters what takes place when you worship. Worship of God, my friend, is not a, pat, a pep rally for the divine. We're not here to work up the spirit. We come together, uh, we don't come together to stir up the spirit. God wants to stir us up. I've heard worship leaders, and i am probably said it myself, we've got to get the spirit moving. Well, as I said, worship is not a pep rally. We've all been to a pep rally from time to time, maybe not since high school, and that's been a long time ago, but we know what they are. 
the cheerleaders try to get everyone in the stands pumped up and worked up and excited about the upcoming event. Worship of God is not like that. Worship of God is not to get everybody jumping up and down in sequence. I'm tired. You can't manipulate the Spirit of God. You can't work up the Spirit of God. You have to let the Spirit move. You have to surrender to the Spirit. Worship is not confusion or chaos. The Bible is clear about that. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church was a troubled church. There were all kind of issues there, but there was an issue of unknown babel coming into the church and it was confusing people and Paul writes to them and he says therefore if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who uninformed and or unbelievers will they not say that you are out of your mind then in verse 33 of that same chapter he says for God is not the author of confusion but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Yes, no form of worship, either loose or liturgical, can be offered as a substitute for heart worship. You got that? All right. In our text this morning, Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman who came to draw water from a well. It it wasn't just an ordinary well. It it was Jacob's well. It was a historical landmark. But it was was an unusual encounter. It, It was at a strange time, 12 noon. Not your ordinary time to draw water when the sun was at its peak and it was hot that was the hottest part of the day at noon it's a strange time it was a strange woman a Samaritan a woman of mixed race an interracial person she had been married five times And the man she was living with was not her husband. Boy, is that applicable today. Which may explain why she had to come at noon rather than early with the rest of the women. We know of the racial tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. The the Jews had their temple in Jerusalem and they thought they were right and They worshiped God there. The Samaritans had their temple. It was was destroyed in B.C. 129. But they were still worshipers at that site, and they thought they were right, and God was worshiped there. What I want you to see this morning is that Jesus seems to be drawing a line, so to speak, on what it means to worship God and who it is who will be the true worshipers of God. Verses 23 and 24 says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So I've already talked about it matters who or what you worship. It matters how you worship. It matters what takes place when you worship. And so let's look at our text a little closer this morning. Jesus says that worship is not a place you go to. Worship, my friend, is not a geological or geographical location. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Now notice that he did not include the phrase and now is in that statement. 
because nearly 40 years from this date, the Romans would come into Jerusalem and would destroy the temple in Jerusalem. And since 70 A.D., there has been no worship of God at a temple in Jerusalem. Currently, the Muslims have the temple in Jerusalem. Unfortunately, there are some who have a theological opinion that Jesus is coming back and he's going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and we will uh, reinstate temple worship there. Uh, We don't take to that theological position. But Jesus is plainly teaching that the word of God is not a place you go to. And you, you may ask, well, pastor, you say I can worship God anywhere? Almost. You, you can say I can worship God almost anywhere? Yeah. I, I've heard folks say I don't have to go to church to worship God. And... Um, I say, well, you know, part of that's true. Worship is not a place you go to, but that truth doesn't justify unfaithfulness of gathering together. Because there's another passage in Hebrews chapter 10 you're familiar with. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more As you see the day approaching, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. The Bible readily admits that in that day, some people were not assembling themselves together with the church, but the counsel of the word is, you don't have to do that. The closer we get to the day of judgment, the more often We ought to gather together. But worship of God is not geography. That's why a small group of three, four, five people can meet in a home and God is there. That's why some congregations meet in a former Walmart (laughs) building. They're there to worship God and God is there. You see, worship of God is not a place you go to. Secondly, worship is not to be in ignorance. Now, preacher, you better do what Ricky Ricardo used to say. You better explain yourself, and I will. I I, I certainly don't mean that we are ignorant people, although we all lack knowledge of some things. But look at what Jesus told this woman in verse 22. You worship what you do not know. We know what what we worship, he says, for salvation is of the Jews. Now just a point of clarification and now move on. The phrase salvation of the Jews should be correctly translated out of. Salvation is out of the NIV uses the word from, salvation is from the Jews. It began with the Jews and it spread throughout. And if you're in Christ, you are because the gospel traveled first in the Jews and the Gentiles and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But look at what Jesus told this woman. You worship what you do not know. Now what is he talking about here? Specifically, He is addressing this Samaritan woman who although may have been a religious person, she may have worshipped God, she obviously worshipped in ignorance. Well, how did she worship in ignorance? She didn't know the God she worshipped. Man, does that have application for us today? You see, worship, true worship, is is done so out of a personal relationship with the one to whom you worship. If we attempt to worship God 
and there's no personal relationship with God. We're just being religious and nothing more. Worship is more than going through religious motions without a personal relationship with the one that you're worshiping. Otherwise, we're worshiping in ignorance. Does that make sense? Thank you. The third thing, what then does it mean to worship God in spirit and truth? Look at verses 23 and 24 again. But the hour is coming... And now he is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now watch this, church. There is to be a likeness between God and those who worship him. Let that sink in. There is to be a likeness between the one that we worship and those who worship him. There is a resemblance between the worshiper and the one being worshipped church, we must be like the God we worship. The God we worship is spirit. And Jesus said that true worshipers must be in spirit. There has to be that likeness between us and the one we worship. There has to be that resemblance especially when we leave this building go out, people need to see the Spirit of God in us. They need to see Jesus in blue jeans. They need to see Jesus in slacks. They need to see Jesus on the job. There, there needs to be that likeness between the one that we worship and the one who worships. Jesus said, those who were the true worshipers are those who worship in spirit and in truth. Paul writes to the Philippian church, chapter 3, verse 3, 4, we are the circumcision. You, know, you, you, you understand? He puts it in a physical sense. He says, we are the circumcision. The circumcision was a sign of the faith of Abraham. But Paul says, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We must worship God in holiness of heart. And I want to tell you the only way that you and I can be holy is to have the holy. The only way. He has to give us the gift of the holy in order for us to become holy. God is holy and true worshipers of, of him must be like him in his holiness. Peter writes, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. You see, carnal worship is in the flesh and not in the spirit. To offer worship that is worthy of God, we must do as the psalmist said in Psalms 96, verse 9, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. See, that's why confession is a part of worship. The first step in being made holy is to confess your sins before the Lord. And we need the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we don't live our lives in the flesh, but we live our lives in the Spirit. 
in spirit and in truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. They go together. You can't separate spirit and truth. So when we come together, no matter how often that may be, when we gather as the people of God, we come to worship Him. It is our desire, it is our intention, it is our purpose to always be in spirit and in truth. When you come into this building to worship God, his, he ought to be the first one you greet. Oh, we need to be a friendly people, yes. But I want to tell you, when we come to worship God, you need to talk to him and not 15 other people around you. we're here to worship the Lord and it's okay to lift your hands it's okay to talk to him what does the word say about God's desire verse 23 Jesus said for the father is seeking such to worship him you know I love to be around my kin folks I don't get to do it very often because I'm so far separated from them. But I love to get around my cousins and you know, just the family reunion. But there's something that I love even more than that. That is getting with my kinfolks in Christ. And I love you know, getting around them. I love seeing Jesus in you and in you. It warms my heart when we sense the fire moving. But it's not about me and you. It's about the lost. They need Jesus. And when he's present in our life and in our midst, they may have to see Jesus in us before they can worship him. Would you stand with me as we pray?